Good morning, Interweb. Let's world build. Tides. What are they? How to calculate them? And how to apply them to your fictional world? Here's the Earth. Here's the Moon. Every point on Earth is gravitationally attracted to the Moon. The closer the points, the stronger the attraction. And because the Earth-Moon system orbits around its barycenter, every point would be subject to centrifugal forces. Combine the two vectors and you get something like this. The oceans will deform along these vectors and boom, two tidal bulges. As the Earth rotates through these bulges, it experiences tides. High tide, six hours later low tide, then high tide, low tide, and back to high tide. Plus a little correction because of how the moon orbits. These are called semi-diurnal tides, two high tides and two low tides per day. Likewise, the sun also creates tides just weaker. When the sun and the moon align, the tidal effect is amplified. We call these extra large tides spring tides. When they're at 90 degrees to one another, their effects sort of cancel each other out. We call these neap tides. Easy, right? Yep, yeah, not really. If this were the case, all areas on Earth would experience equal semi-diurnal tides, but there's actually a ton of variation. Sure, most areas experience semi-diurnal tides, but you also get mixed tides and, weirdly, diurnal tides, one high tide and one low tide per day. In some areas, the tidal range is really large, and in others, it's really small, so what gives? Answer, a lot of things. Imagine an ocean as a bucket of water, its rim a coastline. As we rotate through the tidal bulges, we get alternating high and low tides on either side of our bucket ocean. And because of the Coriolis effect, the whole system will rotate. So essentially, tides are just standing waves centered on an amphidromic point, a point which does not experience tides. In real life, Earth features several of these amphidromic systems, and they interact with one another to give rise to really complicated tides. Why so many points? Well, imagine waves as having a speed limit. If they exceed their speed limit, they'd split up into smaller waves, creating more amphidromic points. The shallower the ocean, amongst other factors, the lower the speed limit. So big, deep oceans like the Pacific will have relatively few amphidromic systems, whereas shallower areas like the North Sea will have loads. Also, the wider the bucket, the more extreme the tidal range, which is why most lakes don't experience appreciable tides. They're just not big enough. Hell, the Mediterranean isn't even big enough and that narrow little inlet isn't enough to change that fact. The Bay of Fundy, on the other hand, is great at generating huge tides. It's shaped like a funnel and gets gradually narrower and shallower towards the shore. This amplifies the tides. In addition, the natural back and forth sloshing of the waters in the bay coincides almost perfectly with the tides, further amplifying them. The tidal range in the Mediterranean is like a few centimeters. In the Bay of Fundy, it can be a whopping 16 meters. That's like 14 whole DeLoreans stacked on top of each other. And then there's the tidal bore, a rare phenomenon that only really occurs in areas that experience large tides. The incoming tide floods any rivers that feed the affected bay, forming a wave that flows upstream against the current. The largest tidal bores happen in the Tiantong River, China. They travel upstream at speeds of up to 40 km per hour, get up to 8 DeLoreans high, you can surf on them, and they produce a low-frequency train-like rumble as they approach. Tides interweb are fracking lit, and weird, and complicated, and hard to compute, but we'll give it a crack anyways. There'll be a calculator in the description, so I'm not going to dwell too much on the math, but to measure the tidal forces exerted by your major moon on your planet, use this equation, with these inputs. For the tidal forces exerted by a star on your planet, use this fella, but with these inputs. Run the numbers. Take the output from the lunar tide equation as your standard tides. Positive, high tides. Negative, low tides. Sum the lunar and solar tidal equation outputs to get your spring tides. Positive, high tide. Negative, low tide. And take their difference to get your neap tides. Again, positive, high tide negative low tide. Finally, multiply each by 0.54 to convert them to meters. To be clear, these values represent the tidal heights in the deep open ocean. Your actual tides will vary massively depending on local geography. Also, all of what I just did is grossly, grossly, grossly oversimplifying things. To actually compute accurate tides, you'll need to run Laplace's equations, which are, um, involved? So we fudge a bit, no big deal. We're not sciencing, we're world building. Anyways, if you want, you can check if anything is tidally locked using this equation. Round your answer to the nearest integer. If it's 50 or above, the object is locked. A planet will be locked to its innermost moon or star, whichever one makes more sense, and a moon will be locked to its planet. 
And boom, horrifically oversimplified title calculations done. Again, the linked spreadsheet will do all the work for you, so you don't need to worry too much about the math. But Edgar, what about habitable moons? Same equations apply, just with different inputs. That said, there is a catch. The tidal force exerted by a planet on its moon will be large, like really large. But in order to experience high and low tides, the moon has to rotate through its tidal bulge. It's a little hard to do when you're tidally locked, which major moons almost definitely will be. Double planet systems suffer from the same issue. Still, for those who want to hand wave this fact, there is a complete moon and double planet tide build in the spreadsheet. But Edgar, what about multiple moons? Again, same equations as before, just run them for each of your major moons and add your results together. Emphasis on major moon here, ignore all minor moons. Now, multi-moon systems will be super complex. Expect each moon to raise its own tidal bulge and expect these bulges to interact in complicated ways sometimes amplifying each other, sometimes negating each other. When all the bodies align, the tides will be seriously big. And if you make it so that this occurs when your planet is closest to its star, the tides will be bigger again. And if you set up a Bay of Fundy-like structure on your world, they'll be bigger again. And if you make it so a storm hits at high tide, there won't be enough DeLoreans around to measure the epicness of the tide apocalypse you've just created. But Edgar, what about multiple star systems? If you have a P-type system, use this fella from earlier and simply combine your stellar masses. For S-type systems, ignore the secondary star. Given its distance, its tidal effects will be negligible. Again, the spreadsheet has multi-moon and multi-star systems covered. Anyways, maths aside, intertidal zones, the parts of the shore that are underwater at high tide, but above water at low tide, are super productive ecosystems. Clams, oysters, mussels, and crabs can be farmed. Algae, limpets, sea snails, starfish, urchins, barnacles, and seaweed can all be foraged. Foragers, like raccoons, bears, otters, deer, and various species of birds can be hunted. So, no shock here, settlements close to shores should do well. However, intertidal zones can affect life on a more fundamental level. No intertidal zone, no land animals. Intertidal zones act kind of like a halfway house for creatures moving out of the oceans to colonize the land. The smaller the tidal range, the smaller the intertidal zones. The harder it will be for creatures to make that initial leap onto the land. If there are no tides at all, life may never leave the ocean. Who then, I ask you, would manufacture the DeLoreans needed to measure stuff? No one. That's who. Good morning, Interweb. Let's talk sources. The method I use to compute the tides is essentially an extension of the method found in GURP space. Links in the description. You need to pick yourself up a copy. Also, if you're interested in a more in-depth explanation of how tides work, check out a channel called Ever Wonder About the World. I'll link two of the relevant videos in the description as well. If you have any questions, leave them in comments and we'll do a tidal Q&A in the very near future. Thank you so much for watching and a massive thanks go well to all the patrons, including Isaac Silbert, Robin Hilton, World Anvil, Ripta Passe, and John Hoyer. Stay awesome, folks. And until next time, Edgar out.